Hello and welcome to the program. Now, today we're talking about prominent Ukrainians and Ukraine-born personalities who considerably contributed to the way the world looks today. Now, in particular, in the sphere of technologies, Ukrainians helped to invent things you can't even imagine modern life uh, without, certainly not me, anyway. Now, uh, to talk more about this, we are joined by a very special guest. We'll introduce him in a second. But uh, first, we welcome to our studio today, Serhii. Vakarin. He's the chairman of Ukraine Information Society Project. Hello, Sahi. Thank you Hello. very much for coming in. Hello, John. It's nice to meet you. So before we introduce our very uh, special guest in a second, I'd like to ask you uh, very quickly about um, the contribution that uh, Ukrainians and people born in Ukraine have made around the world in terms of technology, especially in the IT sphere. Yes, uh, this is the project that we are working at the moment uh, on and uh, this project uh, includes uh, publications about uh, prominent Ukrainians and uh, it includes uh, in particular those Ukrainians that were famous in the world in various fields including high tech uh, but not only and uh, it includes uh, publications about the current uh, state of affairs uh, and now uh, we uh, with the support of the Ministry of Information Policy and the Summit Book uh, Publishing House, are working on a book that uh, will include uh, the most prominent names in uh, um, IT. And uh, here we can name uh, such people as uh, Steve Wozniak, uh, who is well known, uh, uh, Steve Wozniak from Apple. Uh, we have uh, Martin Cooper, uh, who invented uh, the uh, mobile phone uh, as a uh, portable cell phone. Uh, we have people in uh, all sorts of uh, fields like uh, the Ukrainian who got Oscar for mm. um, the uh, ro robotic arm uh, that was used in a shooting of films like uh, Titanic. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. Uh, it's, I didn't know uh, that. Uh, <laughs> um, it's in all the fields um, that uh, are in IT and around. And uh, uh, we will write about many other people. And uh, at the moment, I'm uh, gathering this information and uh, in the process I discovered that probably the most uh, prominent of them, uh, who is uh, Mr. Martin Cooper, uh, agreed uh, to give an interview to us and uh, so it's a great honor to welcome him uh, to the studio and uh, uh, also um, Arlene who is uh, not only uh, his wife but uh, in fact they uh, invented quite a lot of uh, phones themselves uh, together, but uh, I should not speak for them. I think uh, we should uh, really give them the floor about this. Yes. Hello, Mr. Cooper. I hope you can hear us. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on yep. uh, UATV. It's an honour to uh, have you on the channel. Um, so firstly, can you tell us a bit about how you are connected to Ukraine and, and your family roots? Yeah, well, both my mother and father came from the Ukraine. Actually, they came from Russia. Uh, but we were not going to get into that political situation, now, are we? Uh, but uh, they uh, both came from uh, the area around Kiev. Uh, my father came from a place called uh, uh, Skvera. I think that still exists. Is that true? Exactly. Uh, and and uh, my mother came from a town I, that I don't see exists uh, any any longer. It's called uh, it was called Pavlich. Oh, and yes. they you know, they emigrated uh, before World War I. Uh, you know, my uh, grandfather, uh, who I knew uh, very well, uh, was the uh, town butcher. And uh, he had uh, financed a wagon train, would you believe, uh, that oh. traveled uh, throughout Europe. Uh, ended up in uh, Belgium, Antwerp. Uh, he and uh, his uh, eldest son, he had six children, one of whom was my mother, obviously. Uh, they, uh, uh, my uh, grandfather and his eldest son uh, moved to uh, Canada, to Winnipeg. Uh, and there uh, uh, he set up shop and uh, raised enough money to bring the rest of his family to uh, Canada. So that's how we uh, ended up uh, uh, in Canada. 
Uh, my folks ultimately ended up uh, in the U.S., uh, in Chicago, which is where uh, I was born. Yeah, but then they went back to Canada, and uh, uh, I lived in Canada for uh, uh, roughly uh, nine or ten years, and then back to Chicago. So that's the ge ge geography of... of uh, Wow, that's very fascinating. Uh, Say, so I think you want to uh, ask a couple of questions. Uh, yes, uh, definitely. And um, I know that uh, while in the US, uh, you invented um, um, the what we have now as a, a cell phone, as a mobile phone. And uh, I know that everything started from the car phones that were already popular at the time. But you managed to convince uh, everyone that a uh, car phone or home phone is not enough, that uh, things should be really portable and mobile. Can you tell us uh, more about this fascinating story? Well, sure. We discovered, well, you know, I'm going to make, make sure that I can, uh, <laughs> I, I'm looking at a mirror image. Come this way. Of, uh, there we go. <laughs> we see you very well. <laughs> I understand the technology of radio. I'm having a little trouble with video now. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. One of the lucky things that happened to me in my life is that I ended up working for uh, Motorola. Uh, Motorola yes. is a very impressive company. We were in the two-way radio business. Uh, and uh, we progressed from two-way radios, which uh, uh, at that time, uh, the police, uh, uh, fire departments, businesses uh, used for communications. Uh, and we came up with portable two-way radios where a person could carry the uh, radio in their hand and discovered that people saw a new degree of freedom when they were able to communicate wherever they were. And then uh, uh, around 1969, the Bell system, the telephone company uh, in the uh, U.S., announced that they were coming up with a new technology. Uh, they called it uh, a cellular telephony. Uh, you could tell they were a bunch of engineers with coming up with a name like that. Uh, and uh, they, they, uh, their vision of uh, the new form of communications was car telephones. Now, could you imagine... We had been trapped in our homes by this wire <laughs> for uh, for a hundred years, and now they were going to put us in our cars and trap us in our cars. We didn't think that that was the. <laughs> we uh, thought the time was ready for people to have the freedom to be able to communicate everywhere, uh, and so we got into a battle. Motorola was a little company. Well, that wasn't quite that little. It was a billion dollars, but uh, AT&T <laughs> AT was a $22 billion company. They're the biggest company in the world by every measure. And uh, our you know, visionary management decided to take them on because we believed that we had the right approach. Uh, and so uh, uh, we went to uh, our uh, the FCC, who are the people that control the radio frequencies in uh, the, in the U.S., uh, and we told them that AT and T was wrong, and that the system should be a portable system. Uh, and the uh, we were a little bit concerned about government side. You may have that same suspicion that uh, we do uh, that they might make the wrong decision. And that's why in uh, uh, 1972, I decided that the, the only way we were going to persuade our government that the right way to go was with portable handheld phones was to uh, 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 set up this new uh, service called cellular telepathy. Uh, and not only that, make it a competitive business, not a, a monopoly, which is the way the telephone company was operating them. We were worried that maybe they'd make the wrong decision. And that's when I decided the only way to solve this problem is to show them what a real portable telephone was like. 
And so I think I it must have been there. amazing when you were walking uh, around the streets of New York at that time with this uh, phone that was uh, two and a half pounds. Shall I ask you? <laughs> yeah, this is this is the oh, original wow. one. There we go. So, and you, you still have it, still intact, two and a half pounds. And uh, well, I suspect at that time you must have got some interesting looks on the street. We did. This is, uh, in, by the way, this is an exaggeration. It's really this small. You're exactly right. Uh, that, uh, we were standing on the corner uh, of uh, 56th Street and 6th Avenue in New York. New Yorkers are normally very blessed. They see right through you. These people were amazed because, you remember, at this time there were no cordless phones, certainly no cell phones. People could not understand how we were making a phone call, pushing buttons. Uh, on, in the middle of, of the street, so it was a, a unique experience. Uh, I remember uh, one of your interviews uh, where uh, you were asked, what about uh, the time when you were making this call? Did you think about this great future of the mobile industry? And you said that, uh, okay, I hope it works. That's what uh, your thought was. But uh, now you and Arlene are a unique couple and uh, you are working on inventions uh, together. Uh, how does such cooperation help you in uh, your inventions? Uh, what, what are sort of the interesting uh, models that you could mention uh, that were designed in the process of your cooperation? Well, Arlene and I are a unique couple. We have two different viewpoints. I'm a technologist. Uh, Arlene is an extraordinary uh, engineer in her own right. Uh, but her um, uh, viewpoint is more on how do we solve the problems of, of society. And so, uh, uh, when we uh, connected in uh, 1979, 79. Uh, we started this uh, new businesses. Uh, the first one is uh, this is the very beginning of cellular. Uh, very few people had cell phones, so we uh, created a phone that could be put into a taxi cab or a limousine and let people uh, actually rent the phone for a period of time. Uh, this was uh, Arlene's idea. We executed on this. Uh, and from then on, uh, there were uh, uh, other inventions. But then uh, maybe Arlene would like to tell you what her latest uh, invention is like. Good. <clears throat> well, what, what's interesting is that this latest thing we're doing is really more uh, fixed broadband. Um, application and we're working on a way to effectively build an enterprise grade system for families uh, including privacy including storage including AI tools to work against your own data uh, ways that will help families stay more organized, stay safer, and will give them the ability to think about their data legacy, the things that they've done with their cell phones and their laptops and other devices, have them have a single point of reference for reviewing <clears throat> that historical legacy someday for their families. So it includes uh, a robust way of ingesting old photographs and uh, old materials that allow them to narrate the stories behind them. So it's a very big, uh, it's probably the most complicated of all of the projects that we've done. It has more um, slices of technology that have to be integrated in order to make it work. It includes an appliance, it includes cloud services, it includes cloud storage, it includes a lot of the work that we have to do to keep people's data safe. Uh, so, there's, so there's multiple disciplines involved uh, in uh, developing this new platform. Our hope is to go to market sometime early next year. Uh, and we'll slow roll 
so we can make sure that we get it right. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming on our show today. And it's been a pleasure uh, to uh, have you here. So uh, there we go. Fascinating uh, conversation with uh, Martin Cooper there. But um, I'd like to ask you about um, sort of Ukraine's high tech industries as well, because um, as you are explaining in, in the book there, um, it's really developing so fast. And actually, there's not so much information out there or it's either that or the people who do know the information don't want to share it because otherwise their competitors are going to know. So can you tell us a bit more about how this uh, high tech industry is developing in Ukraine and what sort of structures there are in place uh, to help young people? Um, sure. Uh, in terms of uh, high-tech industries in Ukraine, uh, maybe it would be worth uh, using this opportunity to mention that uh, surely uh, Ukrainian high-tech is not only about IT. Uh, Ukraine is also famous in other areas. For example, let us take uh, space. Mm -hmm. And um, the technologies in aerospace uh, um, include uh, various uh, proprietary technologies that are used uh, in many countries. For example, uh, the uh, um, Pivden Marsh plant mm. and uh, the Yuzhne or Pivden uh, Design Bureau developed a lot of rockets that uh, and rocket engines and uh, uh, rocket stages that are currently used uh, in uh, uh, Zenith and Antares and other rockets uh, which are um, uh, launched, uh, for example, in the US and yeah. in other countries. Um, in addition, we can mention Antonov uh, plant uh, and of course, uh, the, the, the famous yeah, the Maria aircraft, yeah. the Maria and Ruslan. Yeah. And uh, in this case, uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, Elon Musk couldn't uh, have finished oh, his yes. mission yeah, with the that. Falcon yeah. uh -huh. uh, be, be, uh, before he used our Ruslan uh, <laughs> carrier of the um, uh, part of the largest part of his rocket of, of the Falcon yeah. Heavy. We're still so, waiting for him to uh, respond to our invite. Actually, yes, yeah. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Let us, if he hears this conversation, maybe he will come to our, the studio <laughs> at some stage. <laughs> exactly. But I think the, the amazing thing with uh, technology is that it's always changing. And um, I always think, I remember when uh, phones like five or ten years ago, they never had the internet. They didn't have like cameras. Uh, you couldn't sort of change uh, photos and all these apps and that sort of thing, like the phone that you, you have in front of you, that sort of thing. They're always very simple. And I thought, well, perhaps this is, you know, how technology is going to be forever. But it, I find it amazing how it always changes doesn't it? Uh, technology is ever evolving and uh, in particular it's uh, worth mentioning the uh, well-known uh, Murphy law that um, yeah, the Moore law sorry in this case uh, which uh, means that uh, there is an ever uh, accelerating speed of changes in technology and uh, well uh, um, who knows maybe we will come to this singularity moments in uh, 2045 uh, as uh, Google promises but uh, yes technology <laughs> is uh, uh, making the speed of changes in the economy, in the society, very fast. And uh, yes, we should be aware of it so that, uh, well... And this has a knock-on effect on different areas because, I mean, part of the reason why there's been such a high economic growth around the world, especially in emerging markets, uh, not just sort of China and India, but also Ukraine as well, is because of this technology. Because since the late 90s, they've been sort of, it's just exponentially growing. Exactly. In this case, we also need to think about uh, people who need to be involved because uh, for many people it means that uh, their skills uh, get outdated and uh, whole industries get outdated. So it yes, must be a problem we... actually because I remember um, my mum telling me that a lot of people in in her class they used to learn typewriting. This was actually a, like a formal qualification that you could get, but the problem was is that by the end. Um, of the typewriting course, the typewriters were slowly going out of uh, fashion. And these sort of, sort of, I don't know, compared to now, they weren't very good computers, but at the time it was sort of high technology. So, how However, you... the typing skills would still be used, and it yeah. means that uh, you need to focus on transferable skills that you can still use after technologies change. Yeah, so it must be quite difficult then to prepare the next generation for new technologies. And, you know, as we were saying with uh, Mr. Cooper there, sort of since uh, that first mobile phone came out, uh, technology has changed so much, and him and his wife have had to keep up with all these changes. 
Uh, for this reason, yes, soft skills, uh, transferable skills, uh, that's uh, the skills you need to be evolving. Uh, and, um, well, Jack Ma said uh, uh, just a couple of years ago that we need to focus on areas that uh, have not been so conventional. And, um, uh, yes, we need to change uh, the educational system to cope with the uh, new technologies, for sure. And, and do you think that there is a, a platform or a strategy to enable the young generation to know in the future what's going to be, or sorry, not to know in the future, but to plan ahead and to be able to have those skills? Or do you still this, you see this is developing? Uh, it is developing. You need to keep your brain up, up to date and, uh, for example, if you see kids uh, playing games, try to uh, sort of uh, encourage them to program these games before they uh, play because uh, some people, some parents actually do this. Uh, you want to play a game? Just program it and then you will play it. Yeah, I think I tried this once. I actually wanted to make a website when I was a lot younger and I tried to make the code for it, but at the time I just gave up in the end because it was so complicated. But there was a result though and it was fairly simple it was just some sort of multi-window website or something you but mastered a lot of skills in the process for sure oh well maybe <laughs> <laughs> aside from this job yes, uh, yes. <laughs> so what are you hoping to do then with this uh, the materials that you have are you hoping to uh, go to different universities or uh, this uh, will be used in uh, many situations mm -hmm. in the business negotiations uh, in uh, diplomatic missions uh, in uh, many contexts uh, for sure and uh, uh, definitely uh, people sometimes even have no idea that these or that technologies are coming from Ukraine. Can you uh, tell us a bit about um, your project itself and how are you going to promote this through universities or diplomatic missions, that sort of thing? Uh, we will uh, gather all uh, this information about the uh, famous people with, uh, uh, in the technology world uh, who are of Ukrainian origin. Uh, then we will publish this book with the help of the Ministry of Information Policy. And uh, after this, uh, actually, it will be available uh, via uh, book fairs, via uh, diplomatic missions, uh, and, uh, well, mo most uh, channels uh, that are used to distribute books will be yeah. used. Well, anyway, thank you so much for uh, joining us in the studio today. It was a pleasure to have you and Mr. Cooper in, and hopefully we'll see uh, both of you again soon. Uh, thank you so much. It was an uh, honor and pleasure. And uh, okay, let us uh, wish Ukraine to be in the 21st century with its greatest technologies. Yes, I'm doing my best. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. That was uh, he Vakarin. He's the chairman of Ukraine IS. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more here on UATV.